Philip Carlin, and he's coming from the Technical University of Munich. Um, he studied there his Bachelor of Engineering uh, in the field of automotive technology, then did his master's degree also in the field of automotive technology. He was like one of my, or like at the department where I work, one of our students, and then he decided to join TUM as a PhD researcher. And he's a PhD, PhD researcher now for around two years. And he took over the lead of the Indie Autonomous Challenge team, especially for the race in Las Vegas. And what he will tell us today is like the approach on how to design um, software for an autonomous race vehicle. And as Raul said, we hope to hear some secrets. Thank you very much, Philip, for being here today. Um, this is our class, F110. They know a lot about racing and they are excited to hear what you tell them about how to really race with a real race vehicle. Yeah, thanks, Johannes, for the kind introduction and also a very warm welcome from my side here from Munich. Um, as Johannes said, my name is Philipp Karle. I'm the team lead of Tomb Autonomous Motorsport at the moment. Actually, uh, one of the successors of Johannes, uh, which initiated our uh, autonomous motor speed um, team back in 2017 where uh, the team joined the Rover Race session, which was the first uh, autonomous racing challenge. And yeah, right now, since two years, uh, we decided to join the Indie Autonomous Challenge, um, which is our maybe a little bit different approach to achieve new uh, insights and uh, achievements in the field of autonomous driving at the racetrack. So it's actually autonomous racing. So, to give you a quick teaser um, about where we currently are, I will show you um, the latest, latest achievements we had with our software back in January of this year at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway in the following video. So this was just um, some weeks ago in Las Vegas, where we could reach around 270 kilometers per hour, which are 165 miles per hour during our overtaking maneuvers against the other car. And all this was achieved by a software which was developed by PhD students. Um, we are uh, 40 PhD students in total, um, supported by undergraduate students, um, which developed the whole software of sense, plan, and act <clears throat> at the vehicle handling limits. And here, yeah, you can, can see the challenge against the, the other race car, uh, where the, the format was that uh, you have to pass the other car each round a little bit faster than before. And as I said, the, the fastest lap was with uh, 165 miles per hour, which was a great achievement. Um, in, in this field of autonomous racing. And yeah, it's unfortunately, um, we had um, the last, um, the last uh, lap over here uh, where we didn't end how we, how we wanted to, um, as we had a little spin, which is also part of um, pushing the limits um, that, that hard that, um, yeah, we actually got a little bit unstable in the end. And uh, over here, um, just a little insight, we detected a ghost object in front of us, uh, which occurred due to, due to the motion blur of the LiDAR. And we had that ghost object in front of us and wanted to evade it. And then we got unstable and our controller couldn't uh, handle the, the car properly. So uh, yeah, we had a spin, but I mean, that's also part of racing and going to the limit uh, that you cannot always finish first. Um, the details about how our software could reach that high speed and that interactive cap uh, capacity with another race car on the track, I will show you in the, uh, uh, in the further slides. So what our approach was to develop this software. Uh, maybe some key facts about the Indie Autonomous Challenge uh, for those of you who uh, might not know the, the challenge. Um, it is an autonomous racing challenge, so it's um, yeah like <clears throat> um, that that the teams have their their, their, their race car, and the, the difference of, is of course the race car equipped with computer hardware and a lot of uh, sensors, 
and the teams had to um, code or program their their software that it ca is um, able to to run the the racetrack. And the idea is actually uh, we have the challenge that we want to develop autonomous driving software, but it's quite hard to test it on the real road because um, you have other traffic participants, um, for example, pedestrians, uh, where um, uh, accident could lead to a fatal um, um, outcome. And on the race deck, you have a challenging environment uh, where you can test your software in an isolated um, on an isolated track without the uh, obligation to um, yeah get the, the permission to drive on on the track as it would be the case in an urban uh, road or public roads. So um, in total, there uh, were thirty teams from universities worldwide who joined initially the the India Autonomous Challenge. So it was a quite international challenge. And with a $1 million uh, prize money for the challenge um, in October 2021 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, which was uh, which is shown on the picture over here. And yeah, just a little um, teaser. We uh, could actually won this race um, in October and could uh, take the money home with us. Um, it was the, the first um, kind of that challenge on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, and yeah. In, in the end, there were nine teams which actually made it to the final because there were several stages. So at the beginning, there were hackathons and um, some simulation races where the teams had to show the, um, their the performance of the software uh, to actually reach the, the final stage at the speedway. So as I al already mentioned, uh, why do we, an institute from the university, join an autonomous racing competition? Well, uh, the, the motivation behind is that currently we see in the field of autonomous driving that a lot of companies drive really a lot of kilometers uh, in scenarios which are quite boring or not that uh, complicated. So you have to run a lot of miles until you get to a situation where your software is really challenged with a complex situation. This is the, the case in normal road traffic. On the racetrack, you have currently complex scenarios, and that's the idea uh, why we um, joined the autonomous racing um, field. So you have complex environment with very few rules. So basically every um, participant or every car can move arbitrarily. And you have the not only complex, but also challenging environment. So the um, vehicles compete against it, at each other, which is also a challenge because you cannot rely on the fact that another car would break for you and let you pass um, before. A second point is that uh, there are also high uncertainties in the prediction, so the forecast of the other um, participants, because you are there are no um, driving lanes like it is on the highway that you know and uh, driver or vehicle follows this lane. Um, but there's just the racetrack and everyone can move around. Another challenge is, of course, the speed of the vehicles. Um, on the one side, of course, for the, for the controller, that the controller is able to handle the vehicle stable at high speeds. But also in the field of perception, it's quite challenging to get a reliable, reliable perception at that high speeds because you have motion blur in camera and the LiDAR point clouds. Um, where you have new challenges to face to get a reliable object detection. Normally, you have a data set at low speeds and urban, uh, urban scenarios where a camera or LiDAR perception work quite good. But at high speeds with the motion blur, you also get in this field new challenges. The fourth point is um, that you have very short reaction times. Uh, from the occurrence of an object until you have to react properly on it because also of the high speed. So you also have the challenge to put all the software um, on one hardware or one computer and apply it with um, um, uh, computation time, which fulfills the, the required um, constraints to properly react on other road users. So all in all, this um, autonomous racing field also um, enabled 
us to develop a full, fully autonomous vehicle software, um, which I will now introduce to you. But before we get to the software, I will just briefly introduce the, the hardware we used. Um, every team was obligated to use the same car, um, except of course the, the colors and the sponsors, but the same hardware setup. So uh, engine, gearbox, aero setup, but also the, the parts for the autonomous um, driving. So everyone had the same GPS, which, which was mounted on the top of the car, which was from Novatel. Radar to the front and to both sides. Um, then a LiDAR um, sensor, which uh, covered a full 360 degree of um, view. And also eight cameras, which was also placed uh, around the car um, to, uh, to detect the objects around the car. So uh, how does our software archi architecture look like? We had um, we have chosen a modular software stack. So it's, I would say the classical uh, approach to uh, separate the, the tasks of the autonomous um, driving software into different submodules. And starting from the sensors, of course, we have um, some pre-processing for the raw sensor input. And then in the field of the detection with the localization, which we realized um, with global localization based on GPS, but also with a local localization, a SLAM algorithm, where we use the uh, LiDAR sensor um, in, um, with uh, reflections on the wall and um, on the surroundings. Regarding the detection of other objects, we had several pipelines. So we used the LiDAR um, input twice, once for deep learning approach and uh, also for a clustering approach. Um, the camera uh, we also used uh, with a deep learning approach, the YOLO uh, and the radar sensor all already delivered an object list. So um, there wasn't the, the uh, requirement to uh, implement an additional um, algorithm to get object lists out of the radar because it was um, delivered by the, the driver of the radar directly. In the next step, the objects were fused in late fusion in object tracking, and then fed into the prediction, just the ta task to forecast the other um, objects. The core part of the software, I would say, is the planning part, because there was um, all the components uh, got together. So there was also the race control with the different um, race flags, like green flag, a red flag, which was required to stop and start the race. Um, there was also information about vehicle performance. So what are the tires able to, to deliver uh, like um, in lateral longitudinal acceleration? And there was also the safety assessment, which was quite, quite important when there's a bug somewhere in the software that the vehicle stops properly. Um, and the, the part over here, like the, the actually planning step was then um, coming from a global optimal race line, so the optimal race line on an empty lab, uh, which was calculated offline, the local trajectory planning module um, used all that information of the current tire performance and also the predicted surrounded objects to plan a trajectory, so a path with velocity information along the global racetrack as fast as possible. And lastly, the controller, uh, we used uh, tube MPC, which is a model predictive control with an uncertainty tube, which I will explain later. So starting with the pre-processing, um, just a few words about it. It was quite important to do the pre-processing uh, regarding the calculation time, um, because otherwise it wouldn't uh, have been possible to even get a reliable or a acceptable um, uh, uh, calculation time. Uh, for for the whole software stack. Because as you can see over here in the picture, a lot of um, points, especially from the LiDAR, were out of the track. So not relevant for the task of detecting other objects. So we had um, two steps of filtering in the pre-processing step to reduce the amount of um, points which were inputted from the uh, sensor. The first step was a geometric and the voxel filter. 
so we used voxelization um, to, to put a grid into the 3D point cloud to reduce the amount of, 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 of points um, and also the, the geometric filter where we could reach a reduction up to 50%. Then the crown filter was the second approach, which just filtered all the points which uh, were uh, reflected from the ground or so the track. And there we just used the geometric information where the LIDAR was placed uh, and with which angle regarding the, um, the, the angle to the ground. And then we could filter out, okay, these are the points in front of the car which just come back from the racetrack. Based on that pre-processing step, we now look into the object detection pipelines of the several sensor modalities. So first step or first perception pipelines are the ones which use the LiDAR sensor. On the one hand, we had the deep learning approach, which was based on the point R CNN, which you might know from literature. And it was actually planned as our primary pipeline um, to detect the objects around us. But um, the GPA, GPU just crashed, crashed some weeks before the race. So we couldn't use the point RCNN because without a GPU, you can't use a neural network. Um, that's also just a little story how the real world problems occur uh, when you deploy a software to the real, real vehicle and to the uh, real racetrack that plans like these to use a fancy um, neural network uh, were thrown away because of GPU problems. Um, the, but um, still, I want to, to um, show some insights into the, the algorithm. So a pointer CNS was a, a two-stage detector. So um, we used an encoder, which was a neural network to encode the, point, the points into a latent space, so um, a feature vector. And this feature vector was um, put in the, the point net to actually detect the objects um, which were surrounding us. On a GPU, we had an inference time of 100 milliseconds, which was quite good for um, that kind of approach. Um, but the major issue also regarding the um, deep learning approach was that we need lab needed labeled training data, uh, which was quite hard to obtain because um, there are actually no data sets for LIDAR on the racetrack. So um, we had to use the simulation with some um, advanced sensor simulations of the LIDAR and build um, uh, the, uh, a 3D um, graphic of the, of the racetrack to enable a simulation of some races against other cars. Um, in a, in a Unity simulation to get at least some synthetic data to train our network before we could uh, apply it to the, to the real uh, racing scenarios on the, on the track. As you can see here, this is one kind of, uh, one example of simulation uh, where we could yeah, run automatically in the simulator and show or um, collect some data um, with automatically labeled positions because of uh, in the simulation you know the position of the other objects and so you could could get at least uh, synthetic training data the second stage of the uh, perception was the clustering so it was primarily planned as just safety pipeline to just detect debris around the car um, based on the uh, agglomeration of some points. But in the end, we had to use it as primary layer pipeline. And the idea behind this is quite simple, actually, um, just to cluster uh, or just to check if some points are in close neighborhood to each other. And then uh, if it's above a certain threshold, they are um, classified as an object. Uh, the, the advantage we used that for that algorithm was that uh, we just had one kind of object on the racetrack, which is just um, another race car. So it was quite easy to, to get a reliable object detection with the clustering algorithm, because all the objects which are inside the track and uh, have enough number of points close, close to each other could be classified as another object. 
So this is uh, how the um, clustering looks in the first step in the simulation, as you can see over here with some cars and but still a lot of um, clusters outside the track. So we removed all the clusters outside. And then, as I said, if um, the clusters uh, are above a certain threshold, they were classified as a valid object. The next pipeline was the uh, radar pipeline, um, which we could use basically directly out of the uh, with the output from the radar sensor because the driver already delivered us an object list which we just had to transform and rotate into the right coordinate system. The radar was quite important for the long range detection and also to measure the velocity of the other objects, which was also quite important because it's the only sensor which uh, which can basically measure the, the speed of other objects. Fourth pipeline was the camera. Here we also made, um, uh, we applied some simplifications based on the, the format of the race uh, on the racetrack. So we used the known height approach. Um, and by this, we could shift our perception from 2D to 3D because it was just a mono camera. So it just have um, a plane detection. And when you want to conduct the depth estimates, estimation, you normally have to use a stereo camera, which we didn't have. So we used the mono camera and um, applied the knowledge. Oh, yeah, here you can see that the mono camera, uh, yeah, the, the first step of the YOLO detection. So you just have your bounding box, as you know, but you don't know where the car is regarding the distance to the ego position. So um, we made usage of um, the known height approach that we actually knew how high the cars are, uh, what dimension they have. And then you could just translate this knowledge into uh, amount of uh, pixels. And by this, you could just um, estimate how far the, the objects are um, in front of you based on yeah, the, the relation between the pixels and the um, true height of the car. So um, these are these were all the, the isolated perception pipelines, um, but they're still output a different object list and also different information. So radar measured also the velocity, the lidar just um, x, y, and yaw angle, and uh, also different a different amount of um, objects. So we use the late fusion approach in the tracking module um, to, to fuse all the object lists and to output one unified object list. And it was not only the unification and um, um, the general idea of doing a late fusion, um, it was also an important decision that we would use late fusion because we could develop all the uh, perception pipelines independently from each other. And we weren't, um, we didn't have the constraint that we have, for example, to create combined camera and LIDAR data. No, we could just separate all the perception steps and Im implement them step by step and fuse all the information in a late fusion approach. So how does the late fusion work? Well, first step is to transform all the information into one global coordinate system. Um, then we had to conduct some plausibility checks because there were still some inconsistencies. For example, multiple detections, especially from the radar of one object. So we had, for example, the front wheel and the rear wheel, which were um, detected as two objects. So we had to merge them. And we still applied one more out of track filter, filter because there were some inoccurrencies in the isolated perception pipelines. Then the next step is the matching. Um, the perception pipelines just inputted object lists. And in the next step, another object list. So you didn't know if the objects from the, um, op from the object list before are the same as in the next step or not. So here we made just a, a matching based on the Euclidean distance. 
So we compared the positions of the object which were inputted before with the positions of the new inputted object and match them with um, optimization problem to minimize the uh, bilateral uh, distances between the objects. And then in the fourth step, the actually uh, state estimation occurred. So we used the extended Kalman filter with a constant turn rate and acceleration model to estimate the new um, state of the object in uh, on the track. Lastly, we also conducted the delay compensation as all the perception pipelines, I just mentioned it with the point RCNN, had quite high inference time. For example, point RCNN lasts uh, 100 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds at a speed of 165 miles per hour are already like seven or 10 meters, uh, which is quite high when you uh, want to overtake dynamically um, in su such a challenging uh, environment. So we had to conduct the delay compensation, which was actually a backward forward integration with the um, Kalman filter. So we integrated the, or we got timestamp of the detection and integrated it forward based on the kinematic model we applied in the Kalman filter to get an estimated position at the current uh, time step um, of, the, of the algorithm. And finally, we got the, the unified object list outputted, which was then um, inputted to the prediction. So, oh, Philip, just a moment. I'll just check a yeah, sure. So on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so any, sure. Any, any questions on the uh, on this previous slide? Yeah, you can come forward. Um, my question is, are the different sensors weighted differently depending on the state of the vehicle? Like you mentioned that there's more like motion blur with the camera and LIDAR when the car is moving quickly. Are they scaled in some sort of way to account for that? Yeah, that was actually quite a um, challenging um, task. Um, as you might know, the Kalman filter is normally used with a um, measurement uncertainty for sensor. So normally you have your sensor, which has a currency or standard deviation, which is uh, assumed that it's Gaussian, but here we have detection pipelines. Um, so the fine tuning of the perception pipelines was um, yeah, a major challenge because for example, with the LIDAR, um, we, we had the quite high influence if the object is in front of us or behind of us. So there we made different uh, measurement uncertainties for um, depending where the object is and also regarding the distance when the object is um, far away we had a higher uncertainty uh, as we as it would be close to us and by this we could um, balance the weights of the different sensor or perception modalities yeah are there other questions would you not follow with your So in, in terms of the, the, the LIDAR, you have both the point uh, uh, RCNN and the cluster matching. What's the yeah, difference yeah. in terms of the output that they are providing? Um, the, the clustering just outputted X and Y positions because clustering is just the center of a cluster um, in space. And the point RCNN was trained or the, the neural network was trained to also output the orientation of the vehicle. So it could um, make use of the exact um, orientation of the, of the bounding boxes around the, the point cloud to also output uh, the orientation. Okay, I think that's good, we can continue. Okay, yeah. Okay, so. Just some insights into uh, the real world problems um, regarding how to um, test and deploy a software stack. So I just uh, introduced how the algorithms work, but um, the, uh, the thing is, how can you um, do multi-vehicle racing with a functional perception uh, when you need perception data 
to even or even sensor data to train your algorithms to do perception. And that's basically the, the chicken egg problem, um, which we uh, uh, try to to solve by just increasingly step by step uh, with the complexity of, of our software. So we just saw before the, the run at 270 miles per hour, uh, 270 kilometers per hour, and this were actually the, f the first steps with um, like 20 miles per hour, where we just had um, the basic approach of hard coding our software to overtake and to just collect data with another object on the racetrack, um, which was the first approach to even collect data to tune the clustering, train the neural network and all the stuff. So this is basically also the, the insight into why we um, have chosen to do autonomous race or even to, to go to a real world challenge, um, because there you have like different problems to solve um, in contrast to just do um, development on, um, on, on large scale data sets. So um, as I already mentioned, object tracking um, outputted a unified object list. And now uh, based on that object list, which is all the objects at the current moment and um, the past of the objects, the task, the, the next step is the prediction. So the forecast of the object into the future for dynamic uh, planning of the ego motion. So how we can, how we could forecast the other road users? Well, there were also some uh, quality requirements for our motion prediction algorithm. And these were that we have to be kinematic consistent, consistent. like we couldn't, um, it wasn't, possible to to handle noisy predictions along the racetrack so we had to create a kinematic consistent trajectory prediction and it had to be even long like five seconds ahead which is um, quite a long time span that our ego motion planner could plan along that horizon of five seconds um, our idea was um, a database algorithm so we used the neural network which where we fed in the tracked information of an object and also the left and right boundary of the track because our assumption which is quite reasonable is that the, the vehicle doesn't leave the racetrack uh, but now the, the difficulty is to have the kinematic consistency still along um, the two boundaries of the track and so we didn't output directly uh, the xy positions um, of the of the other object by just uh, decoding it with a neural network, but instead we use the decoder to just um, output some uh, weights which were used to weight several um, base trajectories against each other. So we had the base trajectory of the left boundary, the right boundary, and an optimal race line. With these three base trajectories, we could. Um, build every arbitrarily trajectory between the two boundaries, depending on the weights of the three trajectories to each other. And by this, we could arbitrarily sample the trajectories the, uh, the vehicle could move along um, in, in the future. And with um, enough training data, we could train the network actually to, yeah, to output the weights based on some assumptions, also based on the interaction with other road users or with the other vehicles, and by then realize the trajectory prediction. The other part, besides the, the weights of the trajectories against each other, was the velocity profile calculation, which was also um, outputted by the neural network and also based on, on um, yeah, training data of typical acceleration braking maneuvers of the objects. Another idea we had um, regarding the prediction was um, that in a race, you normally meet each lap the same, um, the same competitors. So it's not like on uh, public roads that you meet one object just once, um, but instead you meet the opposing car several times um, during the race. So we had the idea that we 
don't just only conduct um, the deep learning pipeline based on offline trained weights, but also with online training. And the idea of online training is to take the knowledge that one car has a specific type of behavior. So for example, a green, the uh, opponent one has a quite aggressive driving software. Opponent two has a little bit more relaxed driving software. And these, um, this behavior actually doesn't change along the race. And so the idea of online learning is to learn the typical behavior of the other opponent and do an overfitting during the inference. So in the first step, when you meet your opponent with a quite aggressive maneuver, you detect it, the, the opponent, and um, you store, this is object number one, um, and the track, um, of the object around one lap or something. Then you use this information, how the, the object drove along this um, lab and you do an online learning of just a little amount of weights in your neural network. And with this um, online learning, you could achieve a better prediction performance as you only would use the general offline trained network. So, um, the, the idea was to use the MixNet, our base software, and just to change the last layer of the network with a specific online learned layer, which was, as I told, just overfitted to one kind of object and then thrown away. And then when the net, next object occurs, the online learning or the overfitting for the next object on the racetrack took place. Based on this approach on, of prediction, the next step is the, the planning of the ego motion. So we have now a prediction up to five seconds of the other road users. We know our uh, current position, like based on the localization. And we also have the information what the global optimal race line on an empty racetrack would be. With this information, we go to the local trajectory planning and create um, uh, yeah, more or less optimal uh, trajectory along the racetrack as fast as possible, but of course with the uh, with the avoidance of crashes with other objects on the racetrack. So, what's the difficulty um, in in planning and controlling in these scenarios? Well, um, as you might know from the the optimization. A typical optimization problems, it's always um, desired that you have convex problems that you find your global minimum. Well, with multiple agents, this problem or the, the convexity isn't always given. So there's a trade off between a high quality solution, which would uh, require long calculation time, and finding the global optimum. And um, another fact was also that we had to um, fulfill our, um, our quality requirements that we find at least an acceptable solution in all the dynamic ranges, which was also the, the challenge that we have to, uh, we have different kind of dynamic limits uh, regarding the, the speed, like we have different acceleration limits and all the stuff. So this was um, all, a challenge to realize in the optimization problem to find a reliable trajectory in the planning horizon. Um, and as I already mentioned, um, this is what I meant with a non-complex, uh, a non-convex problem. You have certain uh, minima you can you can find, um, but it's not given that it's even the global minimum when you choose to follow the the current gradient regarding the optimization. So the idea was to fulfill this um, requirement that you at least find a good solution with a sampling-based approach in a graph. We span a graph around the racetrack. So it was a graph-based planner, which was um, along the X and Y position, but also the time resolution. So for every position around the racetrack, which was a span in a graph, we also had different velocity profiles, how we could reach it. In this three-dimensional graph, we applied a sampling. So we just sampled some 
um, some trajectories along the graph um, nodes. And from this sampling, we conducted a reoptimization in the model predictive controller. This is also important to mention because the approach of our planning just works with a model predictive controller. With a um, normal controller, like a PD controller, it wouldn't work because the um, P PID controller has to uh, receive a steady trajectory, but in contrast, the model predictive controller can handle a non-steady trajectory because it does a re-optimization of the, the inputted trajectory. So by this, we had a quite efficient implementation and still were like in most of the cases quite close to the global optimum with the sampling-based approach. Um, we could also handle different kind of cost functions because we were not relied on or we were not constrained to a convex optimization also regarding the, the, the cost function. Um, and we, uh, yeah, of course, with the, with the uh, model predictive control, we could still achieve a quite high accuracy in um, fulfilling the trajectory we actually wanted to plan. Any um, questions on this? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. This, this is a strategy you guys can use. To, <laughs> this is sampling based. So why don't you ask some questions to understand it better? Or maybe not. <laughs> There are also um, papers uh, of our approaches, so you also can uh, read through it afterwards and just check the details. Um, and of course, write us an email if you have any detailed questions. And um, also check our code because we're even open source. Uh, so we can also try out the code uh, if it works for you. All right. Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, of course, after the or maybe just some, some more insights uh, before we come to the controller. Like, um, yeah, I maybe may also already mentioned the most points of it. So the question of a solution, if it does exist at all in that uh, kind of environment or that kind of optimization problem, um, we had the trade-off between we, uh, we need a feasible solution, but that we could fulfill um, if, it is, if the solution even exists. And even if the solution is not feasible regarding the um, dynamic limits that were violated, so the maximal lateral acceleration or the maximal curvature were violated, um, we could minimize this risk that these kind of um, limits were, uh, were, not, um, were not hold. So this was also an advantage that we could plan um, in a yeah unstructured situations, but still remain some some quality constraints. And of course, second step is the the calculation time, um, where we could achieve some guarantees uh, with our calculation time. Because of course, a graph based approach, you can um, go through every kind of option in the graph, but uh, due to the curse of dimensions, you can't. You have a quite high calculation time to go through every step of the graph. Like I think something like 10 million nodes in our graph in total. Um, of course, in the five seconds, a second um, horizon, not all of them, but still you have a quite high calculation time if you try to find the global solution in the graph in total. So for this reason, the sampling based approach into the graph was also beneficial. Um, and the last point, the cost function, which I um, didn't mention um, that much so far, was also a constraint um, that we had to yeah, find a cost function, which fulfills like most of the cases we could imagine happen on the racetrack, but is still um, possible to, to uh, optimize, like that are not, that we couldn't, um, introduce arbitrarily many um, parameters in our cost functions um, to, to yeah, 
get the optimal behavior. And for that reason, to do uh, to have a cost function but still be uh, able to optimize it, we had a scenario library um, where we implemented some kind of scenarios and then could optimize them automatically to have um, yeah um, parameter set that was feasible and could achieve a quite acceptable performance without uh, requiring too much time to optimize it by hand. So lastly, our controller, as I already mentioned, was a tube uh, MPC, so a tube around the model predictive controller. And the idea was actually that this is two-stage controller. Um, the driving tube was given from the planner, so uh, the planner just um, outputted the desired trajectory, but still gave space, which is the tube, uh, where the model predictive controller could optimize its behavior. So um, as you can see over here, the green area was the, the, the space where the model predictive controller could optimize the behavior of the vehicle. Um, so the, the, the optimization step was conducted and uh, the controller was also able to guarantee some um, guarantees about or guarantee some, some level of uncertainty, uh, which uh, is shown over here in orange. So the model predictive controller predicted the, the behavior of the vehicle in um, for the next um, couple of milliseconds. And then um, the, the predicted trajectory was fed into the PI controller, which actually output the actual comments to follow the, the resample trajectory along the path or along the track. Um, besides that, the the controller all also uh, handled the, the uncertainty regarding the, um, the tire limits, so the acceleration um, between the, the given acceleration and the, um, the planned acceleration of the controller, that um, it could also be uh, seen over here. Yeah, here it is. That the controller is regarding lab time um, quite on the same level of other um, controllers like the um, LQR or typical MPC, but, and this is the important point regarding the uncertainty, with the uncertainty level or uncertainty guarantees, the maximal tire usage was still quite accurate at the limit of the tire. So 1.0 is the limit of the tire, which the tube MPC could hold in the most of the cases we, um, on different lap times, but the other controllers um, were above the limits, which ex actually means that you um, can handle the vehicle properly anymore. There's some question. Yeah, sure. So I have, I have a question where it, it's my understanding the driving to generated by the local planner is that essentially what that way you're giving that is like is the um or like the state limits for MPC, right? Um so you mean where the driving tube comes from? Yeah, yeah. Are, are those like the state limits you're giving to the MPC for refinement or? The driving tube is, um, is predefined actually. Like the local planner outputs a desired trajectory, which, is, um, which you can imagine is the, the line over here. And the driving tube was one meter to each side. Um, so it was uh, fixed before that based on the planned trajectory, the controller gets a space of one meter to each side to re-optimize. But that was just a parameter we decided or we fixed before. So the driving tube is basically an input from, from the planner. Okay, so, so the graph planner is able to use the whole track, but then you limit MPC to just a meter around the trajectory. Exactly, exactly, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, another question. I just have a question concerning uh, your tire models. Kind of back to the chicken and the egg problem. Uh, how did you generate the tire models? And was there any like online learning with that, or was it just something you said beforehand? Yeah, uh, we we used uh, typical tire models from from the state of the art. Um, quite simple tire models, like we've started with Pacheca models. Um, 
due to the calculation uh, time. And actually one of our former PhD students um, did his um, PhD in the field of online learning of um, the, the tire friction. So he basically used uh, Gauss, Gaussian processes to re-optimize the, the tire uh, limits during a lab. Um, but as you mentioned, it's a chicken egg problem. And especially with the tire, you can just, you cannot only drive slowly as it is possible with detection. Now you really have to go to the limit and even the temperature uh, influence is quite high. So um, this uh, estimation of the tire limits was a real big challenge. And also I think one of the, biggest gaps where we could even uh, reach higher speeds if we would know our tire limit um, exactly. And we, in the end, we solved it by really going, or by even checking what's the weather, what's the temperature at that day and um, setting the tire limits quite low, quite conservative that we were sure, okay, even if our controller model is a little bit um, uncertain or inaccurate, we are still sure that we can handle the car properly. So I think we, yeah, several um, or maybe 10, maybe 20% of the tire capacity we couldn't uh, use because our tire models, um, or it was even not possible to uh, fit the tire models properly to the actual, actual limit of the car, yeah. Philip, let me just add something here. What Philip pointed yeah, sure. out here on the slide, what you see, they are using a point mass model. Okay, so you remember I showed you the tire friction. That is what we capture here. And what you see that they were able to achieve 100 hertz of runtime with the FPC by simplifying the model. So having a simplified big dynamics model is totally enough to drive the car because it captures the dynamics very well, but it gives you the super fast runtime of 100 hertz. Okay, so we, because Philip, we talked a lot about vehicle dynamics this semester. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. of course. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's also always a trade-off between uh, runtime and accuracy. Like it's even more important to have 100 Hertz, a really fast update rate um, to, to comp compensate your uncertainty and your errors in contrast to a highly sophisticated model which runs maybe with 10 hertz or something because you cannot 100 milliseconds um, don't react on your on your vehicle behavior. Yeah. Good. Uh, are there some more questions or? Any more questions? Yeah. So I had a question in your perception stack. So basically, uh, you said that when you don't have a lot of data, you can actually build it from simulation. Uh, for deep learning. So how much of a simulation to real gap did you actually notice when you were uh, employing it in real world, or was it perfect for you? You mean the gap from simulation to, to real world? To the real world, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it was uh, quite big actually. Like <laughs> it, in a simulation, you just can do like a little bit of noise on your sensor model and you can basically train really a, a backbone, a base weight parameter set of your neural network. Um, but yeah, as, as uh, we have shown before, uh, we really did some slow runs that we at least can detect, okay, there is maybe an object and also did just hard coded maneuvers. And um, that was the, the key that we uh, had the GPS position of the other car. So we had a quite easily a cron proof to our detected point clouds, uh, but we had to do a, a lot of retraining in the real world and simulation was just, yeah, like a backbone, um, but it's, it was, you can say not possible to, to use the simulation data to really train on that. So the gap was actually quite big. These are very good questions. And so people who have asked questions ask more and people who haven't asked questions, you're paying big money to come to this class. So <laughs> in full use of the world experts on this topic, right? Mm -hmm. So your, your goal should be this lecture or the next lecture, ask a question, at least one question. Otherwise, passive learning is not really learning. So, so ask questions. Okay, we can go ahead. Yeah, sure.
Um, yeah, and right now I think we are through with the software stack and maybe some further insights um, how to how we even develop our software. Because the funny thing or the challenging thing was we in total developed two years for the competition in Indianapolis, but we got our car just eight weeks before the final challenge. So we just talked about real world problems and all the stuff. Um, but the question is, how can you develop a software when you don't even have a car? And maybe some insights regarding um, that fact. So our pillars, how we could at least do everything we can do without a car before uh, was the, were the following. So in most cases, you just see a perception, percep perception stack, which was trained on, uh, don't know, real big kind of data set uh, where you have a really good detection and it works everything properly with the mean average position. You have a controller, which is quite stable on an empty lab. Um, but no one even checked does the perception work with the controller and the planning regarding all the latency and all the stuff. So we really started to integrate all the software, the perception prediction planning control into one full software stack and deployed it on our simulator to check the sensitivity regarding how does a bad per per perception influence the planning and the controller. And there we really could get, uh, we really got some interesting um, or some important insights. Uh, where is the bottleneck in the current software stack? Where do we have to put our development effort into that we get a better performance of the overall software? So this was the first step to integrate the software. And then uh, to test it, um, we did a lot of continuous integration of our, GitHub, our GitLab repository. So there were CI jobs which ran every night automatically. And every morning we got an email, okay, this was the, the, the test performance, the, um, the current software works uh, that good. And by this, we really could find a lot of bugs in the software, um, could track the overall performance of the software automatically and just have uh, the, the uh, in, insurance that the, the software still works properly and we are developing our software in the right direction. Um, another fact, which is uh, regarding to cost functions, we also use the tuning, not uh, the, the, um, the continuous integration and the, the automatically testing, not only for checking for bugs, but also for tune our software. So we had the parameter variation that uh, we use several kinds of parameter sets and checked with which parameter set we could go faster than before. And also, of course, when you want to tune your software, you have to create complex scenarios. And there we had a tool that could create uh, quite challenging scenarios. So the tool could create objects which were um, attacking the or driving quite aggressively. And uh, the actual software had to, to, to handle the challenging situations. And the, the complex situation changed every time or at least some of them to get some, some, um, some general approach to, to test the software. And by this, we could also do a lot of automatically testing and challenge our software uh, by integrating some, some virtual objects in our simulation stack. And the, these steps were all quite important to do as much as possible, especially regarding the behavior um, of the, the motion planner and the prediction accuracy even before we got the car. And when we got the car, we focused on the controller fine tuning because of, um, yeah, for example, different tire temperatures in the real world. And also, especially regarding the sensors part, because these are the, the fields that are close to the real world, like sensors and actuators, but everything in between, we try to integrate and optimize as much as possible before. So one and, question uh, is uh, yeah, sure. from 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 the car, uh, you know, what kind of uh, uh, parameters did you record, like from the CAN bus, uh, from different subsystems in the car, for tuning the controller? Like like even with the tire temperature, you don't you don't have the exact tire temperature, right? So, but yeah, but if you're, if you're measuring the slip, 
how do you what kind of uh, inputs did you get from the vehicle um we we couldn't actually measure the slip um we had some um, tire sensors for the temperature um but they actually didn't uh, never work um we we could just um get some residuals from our state estimation from our ego state estimation uh, as the the quality measurement how good our controller works so when the residual from the state estimation got smaller we were quite sure that our controller was uh, properly uh, fitted to a, a good vehicle model um, but we didn't have the the possibility to measure the slip of course we had models like the like a bicycle model to to model the the, the slip um, but we didn't have the data actually Yeah, is there some more questions? In your pipeline, you mentioned that you estimated the states of the Eagle vehicle before feeding them into the control. Can you shed a bit more light on what kind of algorithms you use for that state estimation? The the ego state estimation or yeah. or the, the state estimation of the other objects? The ego vehicle. Sorry? The ego vehicle. The ego vehicle. Yeah. yeah um, Ego vehicle state estimation was also conducted with an extended climate filter. Um, we used the GPS uh, for the global position and then the wheel speed sensors and also the IMU. So um, we had information about the, the accelerations in translation uh, and, and rotation, uh, the odometry of the wheels, and then the GPS. And we fused all this um, in, into, into the, the, the vehicle model. Um, and this was, yeah, the, the ego state estimation. Yeah. Was there a reason why you chose the EKF as opposed to any other algorithm? Or... Sorry? Was there a reason why you chose an extended common filter as opposed to any other estimation algorithm? Yeah, um, I, I think that the extended common filter is the best trade off between um, be able to at least model slight um, non-linearities uh, like it's yeah as you might know um, that's the linearity around the, the working point and but in contrast to un, um, unscented Kalman filter also to Monte Carlo method it has a quite low computational time as this was actually again an important thing that we could run our extended Kalman filter at 100 hertz and by this, the uh, linearization error got quite small because when you imagine a curve and you just do a linearization by, um, by yeah, just do uh, the, the tangent, um, the error is quite small when the update frequency is quite high. Um, so this was basically the reason. And it's also easy to tune because it's quite intuitive. Uh, with a unsented Kalman filter, you have the hyperparameters, the alpha and the beta with your um high dimensional uh, feature space and with uh, yes monte carlo methods or something like this it's not possible to to get a, a acceptable calculation time yeah one more question mm -hmm. uh, mine is also on the state estimation but not on the ego vehicle but on the opponent uh yeah. prediction so uh how did you get how do you estimate the pose of the open? The pose? Mm, like, for example, the pointer of CNN could at least um, estimate or measure it, or at least output it from the neural network, but the other pipelines could not. So um, we always assumed that the pose, the initial pose, just the initialization of the Kalman filter was along the racetrack, the center line. That at least we don't have an arrow of 180 degrees or something. Um, and then um, you just use the, the, the tracking information along multiple time steps. So the XY position um, from time step zero to time step one um, is related to the to the orientation of the vehicle, of course, because your kinematic model is basically that the X position is the estimated velocity and the uh, uh, sinus of the of the um, heading so this has to fit to each other more or less and if you have a velocity and xy position over here and xy position over there and this is the the, the speed 
uh, the, the orientation have to be something like this. And um, we also had some some measurements in um, that in the, the state estimation that, for example, after around ten or eight uh, eight to ten tracks, so it was around uh, 400 500 milliseconds of tracking another object, we got quite accurate because the filter optimized the estimated state. So step by step, the uncertainty got smaller. Um, so based on the correction step of the Kalman filter, we could quite accurately estimate the orientation based on the previous position steps. Uh, so do you do you assume that the vehicle stays at the same or like for for you to update your state estimation, you have to have observation at time t, right? Like after the vehicle moves from let's say point x to point y, and then you assume that the orientation of the car is at this particular direction. And that's how you yeah. get it. So exactly. Your, yeah. So your observation in your in your Kalman correction step, the observation comes at this particular time step, in from 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 what you observe, right? So, but so yeah, do you assume yeah. that the that the for you to overtake this car, do you assume that the car stays at the same same pose after the observation step, or how does that work? During the overtaking, I mean, oh, right. if, if you uh, overtake the if you overtake the car or uh like let's say uh you know the pose of the car using the position and velocity at time t minus one and uh, and at time t and you say yeah. that the car is is oriented it should be oriented somewhere around, along this direction the opponent's car and yeah. then your observation correction happens only at this time step t right because that's when you have your observation for your uh, updating your carbon filter yeah, exactly. you, if if you have to overtake this car, you do you assume that even a time step T the car is pose is the same with some noise, or that is um, not at all? The overtaking doesn't influence the state estimation because we transform all the inputted object list into a global coordinate coordinate system. Ah, so it, it didn't depend if the detection was from behind or from in front of us. Uh, it's just a global coordinate system where we did the, the state estimation. Thank you. Yeah. In, in your, uh, you know, we are focusing so far on overtaking, but did you have any approach for like blocking the vehicle if you were in the lead position? Yeah, <laughs> no active blocking, uh, but maintaining our line. Yeah, like uh, we really discussed a lot about our behavior. Um, if we uh, uh, got overtaken um, and uh, like the, the best behavior we also like thought about Formula One about human drivers is actually just to maintain your race line and drive as fast as possible because it's also the, the, the thing you would do if you are alone on the track and want to race as fast as possible and so we didn't uh, do any active blocking uh, we just try to follow our race line and yeah close the door maybe but not actively but just follow the race line Some more uh, i had another doubt so in your uh, previous slides you mentioned that um, you would be checking at each point of time how aggressive the opponent is going to be and depending on how aggressive the opponent car is going to be you will uh, basically plan the path of your car according to the prediction like what how uh, maybe how fast it will go or what path it is going to be uh, taking so can you please explain a bit about that i mean how uh, the algorithm actually works how do you estimate whether it's going to take a uh, I, I don't know i mean it's going to try and cross you or how aggressive it's going to be and again i mean uh, going back to the problem uh, if it does something that your algorithm uh, says it will but it does not then uh, what safety measures do you take uh, to make sure you uh, maintain the lead mm -hmm. um, maybe regarding the, the first point like uh, as individual behavior of another object um, it was basically uh, like we use a, a deep learning approach for the prediction so the only thing we did is actually detect this is 
the first object and we try to recognize it again in the next lab when we meet it again. So it's the same object as before. And then the rest is basically the, the, the deep learning that um, we just changed one layer in the prediction net. So we could guarantee that the prediction doesn't do any strange things like it's a black box, you never know what it does. But when you just change one layer, you at least, or we could prove it with also some quality measurements that the prediction gets not worse. And uh, with just changing one layer, we did an overfitting on one specific behavior um, during the inference. Because the, the interesting thing with the prediction is you don't need a labeled uh, data set. You just have to wait until the prediction horizon passes and then you get your ground truth from the perception because you just ha have to watch how the vehicle behaves. And this was basic, it, this is the ground truth for the prediction you did some time steps before. And this knowledge we, in, uh, we incorporated that we predicted one object um, when it passes us or something, we track the crown truth, how it really drove. And this gap we use to retrain just one layer of our network to overfit on the specific behavior of one object. Okay. And is your software stack, is it based on like ROS, ROS2? Um, yeah. and, and did you have any kind of like, how did you, okay. And if you had yeah. any like kind of timing issues with uh, running on ROS2 or how did you deal with did the DDS actually uh, be mm -hmm. was it did you use certain DDS mm -hmm. messaging uh, capabilities for timing management? Yeah, like um, regarding the the middleware and all the stuff. Maybe here's some some insights. Uh, we used a container containerized uh, approach and ROS two as middleware with Cyclone DDS. Of course, we had some problems with quality of service, and I think there's also a big. Um, big um, gap where we could optimize some more because actually the software isn't synchronized. So it isn't scheduled that the first module finishes and then the second starts to calculate. No, it just run independently from each other. Um, but we could, yeah, it was a little bit of trial and error because it was also the first time that we worked with ROS2. Uh, so we also had to gain some experience in that field. But regarding the calculation time, it was the major part um, to choose the right program, uh, programming language. So we used a lot of Python, uh, especially for the deep learning uh, stuff and also the, I would say, more research related topics, like really new approaches, new algorithms, which you have to rapid prototype. And as the implementation was fixed or the, the idea of the algorithm, we tried to uh, move as much of the code to C++ or at least to some things like Cython or Numba that at least it's pre-compiled into a Python software stack to just reduce the calculation time. And some parts were also natively written in C++ and uh, yeah, our, our control software was actually in MATLAB and MATLAB Simulink and was uh, compiled to C++. And this was basically the, the major influence regarding the calculation time to reduce it in that in the safety critical parts of the software with another programming language to at least fulfill some some constraints. Okay. More uh, questions? One or question. Yeah, uh, sure. Hello, hello. Um, I want to continue on the previous question about the opponent estimator. So um, after you estimate the opponent car, um, how do you predict the uh, future state of that vehicle? For example, like uh, the vehicle state um, position velocity in the next uh, two or five seconds? Yeah, it was the idea um, I showed. Uh... Somewhere over here, like we inputted the past position of the object and the track boundaries. And the assumption is object stays inside the track boundaries. Then we input the left boundary and right boundary and an optimal race line between the boundaries. 
And then we have three trajectories like send or race line, left boundary, right boundary. And then we use three um, weighting parameters, which sum up to one, which are outputted from the neural network to superpose, uh, superpose all the three base trajectories. And this is the output to predict the other objects. So it's shown over here that you have um, the encoder, all the features you need. Um, and then with the softmax function, you do the superposition of the base trajectories, which are then output to a trajectory together with a velocity profile, which is also learned by the neural network. And um, yeah, of course, the network is learned with a, with a lot of training data regarding um, op overtaking maneuvers, acceleration, deceleration, empty labs, and all the stuff. Yeah, we have one more question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one question regarding the open and uh, uh, state estimation. You mentioned something about Hungarian matching. So is the matching happening between the time steps or uh, between uh, different sensor uh, outputs for the uh, for the same time step? Mm. Yeah, it's over here. Yeah, the third step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, the it's the thing that the delay compensation actually occurs over here, but also at the beginning. Um, because you, you get multiple objectives from different sensors with different time steps in. And of course, you cannot uh, compare positions of one object list with timestamp A with uh, positions of another object list with timestamp B if the timestamp does not match because place and time has to fit, right? And for that reason, the delay compensation. Um, was conducted in the end to get the current time step, but also at the beginning to synchronize all the object lists that were inputted with the old, uh, with the est with the predicted state from the Kalman filter in the, the prediction step. So before the matching, there was yeah another forward integration um, of the object list to have them all with the same time step, and then you can compare them based on the Euclidean distance to each other. Yeah, what's the cost that we're trying to optimize here for the matching? Is it just the um, it's, it was cross, uh, it was just uh, Euclidean distance. And actually, we rate? also yeah, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we also tried something like uh, minimizing the the likelihood. Um, so based on the uncertainty of current state, that you also um, use the the uncertainty in lat and long with the matching, but it didn't even get better so uh we just used the Euclidean distance and yeah it it worked quite okay i would say yeah and when you're measuring the distance you just take a center point of the detection or you just like some kind of uh, center of mass calculation or something like that like that yeah um no it was just a center point okay thank you yeah <laughs> one more question <laughs> sure so what, what kind of solver or what kind of method do you use to solve your re-optimized MPC problem? What kind of solver you mean? Oh yeah, or what kind of method do you use to solve your re-optimized MPC problem? Mm. You have a re-optimized MPC problem in the in the neo slides. The the the, the, the re-optimized model predictive control problem. So, so what kind yeah, of method yeah. or what, what kind of solver do you use in this neo scenario? Um, it was a MATLAB toolbox. Um, it, I would have to, to look it up. I can, um, I can tell you it's, it's CBX PI QSQP. That's a solver. It works. <laughs> We have another question, Philip. <laughs> sure, no worries. It's good, it's good, it's good. Yeah, ask questions. Um, we'll go ahead, yeah. I'm uh, talking about your MPC again. Uh, could you talk about the constraints you had in mind while while modeling this? Like, did you have any constraints in the MPC from a uh, cost formulation or were there no constraints at all? Well, one, one major uh, point was the uncertainty quantification. Um, 
that we could secure a, a quite uh, or a certain level of uncertainty regarding the, the optimization horizon um, that we basically it's a trade off between the performance of the controller regarding the lab time um, and but also the 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 const uh, the, the the constraint and uh, the maximal tile usage that uh, we could secure fast lab times but still um, stay below a certain kind of um, violation of some dynamic constraints thank you thanks I think that was for the question for now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, maybe some in the end, um, most of our software is even open source. So if you want to have a look at it, um, just go to our um, GitHub repository. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, also for the for the question. Uh, it was quite interesting to interact with you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, yeah, and I hope you uh, got some more insights about our activities in autonomous racing. Uh, maybe here you see your professor, by the way. Um, <laughs> so thanks a lot um, for your invitation and yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philip. I think this was very interesting and I'm sure we'll have more follow-up questions after this also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's pretty late your time, but thank you for taking the time out. All right. Yeah, sure. No worries. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. See you, Philip. Bye. Yep. Ciao.